So my title is From Bench to Bedside, The Role of Science in Treating a Deadly Disease. And this is related to something that Roy talked about, which has been a, a part of my career for a long time, which is to uh, understand how diseases occur and then try to fix them. Uh, so the talk will be in two parts. Uh, the first part has to do uh, with um, one of the companies that I co-founded that's recently had a great success in the clinic um, and has become an FDA approved drug. I'll talk about the basis for that disease. And then I'm gonna hone in on a topic that's been near and dear to my heart, no pun intended, uh, for a long time. And that has to do with sex differences um, in the cardiovascular system and how poorly it's been actually studied um, over the years. So, I'm gonna talk about initially genetic heart disease as opposed to lifestyle. And so this is something I started doing uh, when I was basically a graduate student mapping genes in the human genome and then continued uh, throughout my, my career. And as I mentioned here on the slide, that is a, as opposed to lifestyle. That isn't to say that lifestyle can't modify or affect genetic disease because it can. And I'm gonna show you a little bit about that, but all of um, the fundamentals of trying to develop therapeutics have to do with uh, genetic heart disease. And so the disease that, that I will be talking about has to do with um, a disease called hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And that sounds like a fancy uh, couple of words, but really all that that means is that uh, the big sick heart that runs in the family. So the most common genetic heart disease is, is this disease called familial hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Um, and so the, the, the hypertrophic means big, uh, cardiomyopathy means disease, and the familial means that it runs in your family. So hearts can get bigger in different ways. And these are human hearts. Uh, the one on the left um, is uh, very, very sick. The, the, the muscle is really, really thick. And you can see that there's this hole here, which is the chamber compared to the chamber over here. So you can have hearts that change in the, these two ways and then probably everything in between. And so the types of cardiac enlargement are uh, frequently parsed into two types, bad and good. Now, the bad form is like the one on the left that I just showed you here. And what that is, is a big, thick muscle in a very small chamber. So this will not pump a lot of blood through the body. So this is really not a good situation. You can also have a heart that's healthy that gets bigger through a variety of mechanisms. So one of them is postnatal growth. So you're, what the number of uh, heart cells that you have when you're born is about the same number as you have throughout your life and the heart cells themselves get bigger and your heart grows uh, from its size as an infant up to an adult. Chronic exercise also can make hearts get bigger in a good way. Um, and swimmers are among, are among the athletes with the biggest hearts. Your heart also grows uh, during pregnancy and that is generally a reversible thing as is the chronic exercise. So if you stop going to the gym, if you've had an enlarged heart because you're a chronic person who, a pr person who uh, exercises chronically, then you stop, it's kind of horrifying how quickly your heart will then shrink, just like your skeletal muscles, if you stop that exercise. So these two are quite reversible, and this is uh, much less reversible, although sometimes treatment of high blood pressure can actually get your heart to shrink back some of its uh, muscle growth. So as I mentioned before, enlargement equals hypertrophy. So this disease that I told you about, this deadly disease, um, this hypertrophic cardiomyopathy causes over 30% of sudden deaths in young athletes. And these are just a few of the people who have died um, from this tragic disease. This uh, poor young man, uh, Hank Gathers, died on television in an NCAA uh, tournament a long, long time ago. Reggie Lewis and Damian Nash of Denver Bronco. Um, also died of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And you occasionally hear reports of this, sometimes in people who are 12 and 13, sometimes it's people in their 20s, um, but also it can happen in your 50s and 60s. So a summary sort of oversimplification of this disease is that mutations in genes that make the heart contract are responsible for this genetic disease. 
It's a lot more prevalent than people originally thought. It's found in people about one in 500 people. And usually people have one normal gene and one mutated gene. And that has implications for therapy because you've got only one of the, the genes that's mutated. If you have both genes mutated, usually those people uh, don't survive. So until recently, there were no approved therapies except for a heart transplant, only treatment of symptoms per se. There are potent sex differences, which I will come back to. Males have much worse disease than females at younger ages, and that's something that our lab has been studying for some period of time. So here's what can happen if someone in your family develops symptoms or dies from hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So your family might have the person's DNA screened, and you can find a mutation that is known to cause this disease. And so what do you do with that information? You can choose to get your own DNA screen for the mutation if someone in your family has had it. Some parents don't want their children tested, uh, particularly when they're quite young. I had a, a, a father call me um, because his uh, eight and nine-year-old sons um, had uh, wanted, there was a discussion about whether they should get their kids screened. The wife did not want to, and the husband who had had um, uh, several cardiac arrests um, and had a defibrillator implanted, he wanted to get them tested immediately. And the parents, the mother did not. She wanted to wait until they were much older. And so it's a real dilemma about what you do with that information once you have the DNA information. What are you gonna do about it? So let's say you find out you have the mutation and you're not a little kid, but you're, you're an adult. So sometimes, unfortunately, the first symptom is sudden death. So those people who um, find out they have one of these mutations can lead a very fearful life with frequent testing for an enlarged heart or for symptoms. And so people with the mutation are told to lead sedentary lives, even as children, and that's resulting in a whole nother set of problems for these individuals. Many of them are becoming obese and diabetic. Um, and so that's not a good thing either. So it, it is a really uh, serious disease, and that has prompted us, at least, to try to understand how these mutations lead to the disease, and then what can you do about it? So in order to treat the disease, you first have to understand the healthy heart, and then to understand how the disease develops. So if you think about it, your heart is a big muscle, and it beats 100 times 100,000 times a day, it pumps blood 12,000 miles per day. So it's a really busy organ. Um, and heart cells, this is kind of always fascinated me. You can take the heart cells, which make up the heart, and you can take them out of the heart and you can put them into what we call tissue culture, where you're putting those cells and you're growing them. Um, and then uh, you don't need to be in the heart for the heart for the heart cells to beat with no stimulus. You don't have to do anything to them at all. They just beat on their own. So this is a single, a beautiful single cardiac muscle cell. I happen to think they're gorgeous. Um, I have a picture of this one, for example, hanging in my office right now. And our provost, Russ Moore, has a similar picture hanging in his office because he used to work on heart cells too. So you may notice something if you've um, looked at cells at all, which some of you have, but probably most of you have not. Um, sorry about that. Uh, you'll notice something that might be a little different. And that is that this is a nucleus where your DNA is. So these heart cells have two nuclei, which is unusual. Like most of your cells in your body have one. It's not entirely clear why some, many cardiac myocytes have two of these things. And, but they're actually quite lovely, I think. Um, and this part of the red is the contractile machinery that we're gonna talk about is what it is. So these are the cells that you can see that beat in your heart. And you saw some um, uh, much younger ones in that video before. And so a long time ago, a myosin gene mutation was identified as causing this lethal disease, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So the gene responsible for this disease was published in 1990, and we're only just now beginning to understand exactly what these mutations do. This is a heart of somebody with one of these mutations, and you can see it's kind of a disaster. This is a healthy heart where the cells are kind of lined up in a nice array. These are very disorganized, and this is um, not from a, a, this was from an autopsy, so this person died of the disease. Um, and so the genetic basis was discovered quite a long time ago, 
And we set out along with other labs to try to understand what it is that these mutations do. So this is the myosin motor. Um, and you can see what's happening here is that this is the, what we call the thin filament, and this is the thick filament. And this causes the sliding that results in muscle contraction. And so how do these myosin mutations cause hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, this lethal disease in um, young, frequently in young people? So some mutations likely affect its motor properties, which I just showed you on the uh, previous video. So how can we study that? So we can measure many aspects of myosin function, both the mutant and the non-mutant, or what we call wild type, or healthy or normal. This protein is one of the best studied proteins in biology, myosin. And there are lots of flavors of these motors. Um, there's a predominant one in your heart, and it's called beta myosin or myosin 7, but that's really not important for the context in the context of this talk. But that means we can measure myosin's motor activity under a microscope. We can actually watch the myosin moving and another part of the muscle machinery and measure the speeds with which they do that. And the speeds can be a property of these different flavors or these different types of mutations that cause this deadly disease. So what you can see here are these white little worms. So what you can't see in the black is the myosin motor is on the bottom of this surface. And these white things are actin filaments. And the motor activity of the, um, of the, the mutant and the wild type will give you a speed. And then you can see that the one on the right is running much faster than the one on the left. And mutant and normal myosin motors can move at different speeds. They could be faster or slower depending on the mutation and depending on which one of the diseases you're talking about. So one of these mutations, you saw the one that was um, going faster and produce, it can also produce more force. So that's another thing we can measure in the motor is how much force it generates. And so what you can see here is that one of these mutations produces increased force, and you saw a faster motor on that previous slide, and is what we would call a gain of function mutation. So frequently you think about a mutated protein that does something bad, like cause a disease, and you might think that it's become inactive, or it doesn't function in the same way, but it's less of a function, you're losing function. In the case of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, many of those mutations are gain of function, and you can see that this what you're looking at here is the force of this mutant molecule. This is one that causes a very deadly form of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, and it produces more force and is faster than this wild type or uh, non-mutant uh, counterpart. And so our long-term goal for quite a number of years was to develop small molecule therapeutics that can treat inherited cardiomyopathies. So what do I mean by a small molecule? I mean a small chemical entity like aspirin shown here. And so they can differ in size. So you may have heard of growth hormone that is used therapeutically or monoclonal antibodies um, that are used and they're increasingly used in treating cancer. So any drug that ends with an AB means that it is a, that in its name, that means that it's a monoclonal antibody. And you can see that this is 25,000 atoms whereas aspirin is 21. So what I'm talking about is this category of potential therapeutics. They're fairly inexpensive uh, to make. Um, and that was the target that we developed, we decided to uh, go after in terms of finding a small molecule therapeutic that could be used to treat these genetic cardiomyopathies. So there are lots of sizes as well as types, and they vary widely. And there are strategies that are used by many companies to do um, any one of these uh, three approaches, like a hormone or a monoclonal antibody. So I and um, three other people co-founded a company called Myocardia. It was in 2012. We went public in 2015. And we identified a small molecule that was FDA approved just in 2021. Our company was acquired by Bristol Myers Squibb in late 2020. And that really is a, a great thing that these uh, have happened because, as I mentioned, the only treatment for this disease that was, um, had any effect at all was a heart transplant. And there aren't enough trans hearts to go around to treat 
people who have um, one in 500 people who have one of these mutations. So before start starting out to do this, are myosin modulators feasible, meaning small molecules that will affect myosin's activity in some way? And if they are, can they be used to treat myosin-based diseases? So our approach at myocardio was to find a small molecule that inhibits the myosin motor to treat hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And so what that is akin to is putting the brake on the myosin motor, again, to decrease its hyperactivity. So what is the rationale for inhibiting the myosin motor in HCM patients? So we already knew from patient studies that patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy have hearts that contract too much. Many myosin mutations have increased function, which as I mentioned before, can be just as bad as having decreased function. And we developed at myocardia compounds that can do either of those things, meaning inhibit myosin activity or an increase myosin activity. But I'm only talking about the inhibitors right now. So how do mutations in cardiac myosin make it have increased function? They make the motor have a shape that makes it be more active. And I'm just going to show you a schematic of this without going into uh, the details for this. So HCM mutant myosin has more of this active form. So this is these motors, and they're kind of um, extended in an open configuration. The mutations that cause hypertrophic cardiomyopathy have these motors now folded down, and that's a state we call a closed state. So we know that the mechanism of these mutations having hyperactivity is that it makes the protein assume this shape more than this shape. So what we did over a number of years was to ship, find a small molecule that converts this shape, this open, more active shape, into this less active, closed shape. So here's what this looks like in data form. So this is myosin's motor activity, or otherwise known as ATPase. And here's the drug concentration. And what you see is that this has a nice inhibition of this ATPase activity of a function of the drug concentration. And so this is exactly what we set out to find, is small molecules that did this. So we ran multiple successful clinical trials on HCM patients. And so the timeline here, just to remind you, is that the genetic basis for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy was discovered in 1990. Myocardia was founded in 2012. We went public in 2015, which for those of you who don't know a lot about the kinetics of, of um, drug discovery is really quite fast. And the FDA approval was obtained in 2021. So beyond hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, we want to be able to extend our approach to other genes and diseases caused by mutations in the muscle contractile machinery. And that's uh, work that is continuing uh, today. One thing that we did, which I think was a great service to the um, uh, cardiomyopathy community, was that we established a sarcomeric human cardiomyopathy registry and what that means is that we got 7,000 HCM patients and 2,400 of a different type of, of um, dilated cardiomyopathy patients in 12 centers around the world. And we have huge amounts of clinical information and DNA databases. So this sets the stage for all kinds of future investigation. And again, that's work that is, um, continues to be ongoing. So will this approach work for other diseases? And might that include very rare diseases for which drug development might not be a viable business option? And what I can tell you is that we are currently um, testing this on some very, very rare diseases, much less common than one in 500 people. Uh, some, in some cases, for example, uh, they might be so uncommon that we don't even know what their frequency is. But if this general strategy works for a disease that's more common, like this hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, we might be able to translate that information to other rare diseases where there are also absolutely no treatments. And for the people who have those mutations, they have a fairly significant negative impact on their quality of life. And I think that that's something we've got some incredibly encouraging data 
on a couple of other myopathies that are, as I said, much, much um, more rare. And I think we could build on the success of myocardia to develop uh, strategies for those individuals as well. So many companies like myocardia are developing precision medicine or, or sometimes otherwise known as personalized medicine based on genetics. But let's not forget about biological sex. So this brings me to the next part of my talk, which is that a woman is not a small man. Sex differences in the heart. And what I mean by this title is that um, frequently physicians will dose the individual purely on the basis of body mass, not taking into account that there are a lot of differences between men and women besides the size of their body mass. Um, structurally, functionally, and I'm gonna show you a little bit about that. Um, I think that you'll find some of these things surprising. So a long time ago, um, Time Magazine had a cover that showed that, uh, that one in three women will die of heart disease and what you can do to protect yourself. Because this was actually a fairly startling uh, observation and revelation to many people. So cardiovascular disease is the leading cause of death in women and that more women die of heart disease than the next seven causes of death combined. Most people, when you take a survey, say that it's cancer, and they'll even say, if you talk about women, they'll say breast cancer, and it's not close. But if you poll 90% of primary care physicians don't know this and don't know that heart disease kills more women each year than it does men. There are sex differences in cardiovascular systems pretty much every place we and other people have looked. There are sex differences in exercise, the cardiac benefits of exercise, in heart attack, high blood pressure, and the response to treatment of high blood pressure, genetic heart disease, chemotherapy-induced cardiotoxicity, and drug metabolism and efficacy. So pretty much every place we have looked, we have seen uh, sex differences. And many of you may have heard anecdotes from people that a woman going into an emergency room and complaining of symptoms may be turned away and told to go home and take some anti-anxiety medication, which is really pretty offensive. Um, because sometimes the symptoms of heart attacks in women are really quite different than they are in men. Sometimes it is you know, exertional chest pain radiating down your left arm, but sometimes it's back issues, shoulder pain, neck pain, uh, et cetera. Um, and so a lot of people uh, end up, not a lot, but, but I've, I have talked to probably at least 10 or 15 women who've told me personal stories where they've gone to the ER and been sent home. And so what do we do about this? So we have to take into account that most research is done on men and male animals. That's even true now. Even worse, in some ways, that, that if you look at animal studies, less than one quarter of them report on the sex of the animals. But even worse, they mix them together. So then if you did have some sex differences, you would cancel them out because you'd be lumping your male and female animals together. And so uh, the NIH has now, at the National Institutes of Health, which funds a lot of research in heart disease, now mandates that you actually specify the sex of the animal, or if you're not able to study it in both sexes, you have to explain why. So for example, you know, pregnancy, of course, you're only gonna study in females, prostate cancer, you're only gonna study in males. So you, can, you don't have to if you can't, um, but if there's no good reason to eliminate one of the sexes, you actually have to propose studying both. That's only been since I think 2016 or 2017. So we'll see what the longer term effects um, of that are. So I'm gonna talk about some of the sex differences that we have studied in, um, in our lab. So cardiac function is better in younger female hearts. And what you're looking at here is what we call fractional shortening. And that's the extent to which the heart does this. And you can see that at the same ages, that the male hearts contract less well than do the female hearts. Another thing that we can measure is stiffness. So a stiff heart is a, not a good thing, that's a bad thing. Um, and stiffness comes from uh, fibrosis, for example. And so fibrotic organs and hearts are really not healthy. And what you can see is that the male hearts are more stiff 
than are their female counterparts. Again, these are um, at, you know, sort of um, young adults uh, to middle-aged adults, I'd say. So many aspects of cardiac function are different between the sexes. And we in my lab here at CU have been delving into molecular mechanisms that cause these sex differences. So one of them that I mentioned at the very beginning is exercise, sex, and the heart. And this has been um, a very interesting study to do. Um, I have to say being in Boulder where everybody is physically fit and exercises all the time uh, has bolstered some of this research. Although we did start this uh, back years before I came to, to see you um, when I worked at Albert Einstein. So mice, uh, we've done this, we've done similar studies in rats, but we've done many more of them in mice um, because of the genetics of the mouse. So we don't do anything fancy. We go to PetSmart and buy a hamster wheel and we fit them out with sensors and magnets that where we can measure the speed and the um, time um, uh, run. And what we see is that this is not calibrated to a, a human stride length. These are absolute 35 to 50 kilometers per week. And if you want to put that into perspective, even in Boulder, there aren't humans who do that. So humans, if we ran as much as mice, would be running 575K per week. And that's a phenomenal amount of exercise. So I, I do want to put this into context that there aren't humans who do this. So mice run enormous amounts. Rats don't run spontaneously nearly as much. So one of the things that um, I wanted to point out is this is this voluntary cage wheel. We like voluntary cage wheels because we're not forcing the animals to do something. And there's no incentive nor disincentive uh, for them to exercise. There are other uh, exercise models like swimming. Um, and running on a treadmill, those two are very stressful because the animals are forced to do those um, exercises. And I will tell you just as a little anecdote, um, a couple of people in my lab decided to give uh, mice some sugar cookies uh, at Christmas time. And I wouldn't have suggested that they do this. They didn't ask me, they just did it because they thought it would be nice to give the mice a treat. And so just like with human, uh, uh, children, for example, uh, I noticed in the recordings that the animals were running about 30 or 40 percent more over the, this Christmas time. And I asked the guys in the lab, I said, what did you guys do? And they said, oh, we gave them sugar cookies. Um, and so you can induce these animals to run even more if you want to. Uh, I asked them, please not to do that again, because it wasn't a very scientific approach. So we got, because we always have studied male and female animals um, and people, um, we were somewhat surprised to see this. Females run more than males independent of their age or their genetic background. So there are different genetic strains of mice. And so we thought maybe the strain of mouse that we were running in this experiment shown here was having some effect uh, that wouldn't be seen if we looked at six or seven other strains of mice and they all looked the same, meaning females always ran more. And age doesn't change that either. So what we're looking at here is the average distance per day in male and female mice at four months of age and 12 to 15 months of age. So these are pretty old mice and they do run less. Aging definitely uh, slows them down just like it does with most, most people. But in both of these cases, you're seeing the females cover a lot more distance than the males. Probably more interestingly to me was that the females have better cardiac responses to exercise. So I mentioned at the very beginning that athletes' hearts are big and they're very healthy. And so what we saw was that you get bigger hearts per kilometer run. The females run more, so we have to normalize to the distance run. And when you do that, you see something pretty phenomenal, which is you get much more uh, exercise benefit um, if you're a female than you do than if you're a male. And we believe we have some understanding about the reasons for that, which I'll come back to at the end. So many of us who study exercise in this sort of artificial setting of putting a cage wheel you know, into a cage and then letting the mice run or not run have said that well, you know, this is a laboratory setting and has nothing to do uh, that's relevant to animals in the wild. Well, let me just 
tell you that that's wrong. Um, and so this was a study that was done uh, by a colleague of mine at the um, in the Netherlands, and this movie was showing, but it's not showing now, but you don't need to see it. What you can see, she ended up putting cages um, in her uh, yard. And she put some in sort of brush, and then she put some uh, in open field. And she had 200,000 creatures ran in the wild over a three year period of time. And it was really pretty interesting because bigger rodents, and it wasn't even always rodents, there actually was a snail on there at one point, um, but the bigger animals will kick the little ones off the wheel. And so there's clearly some motivation for them to run, um, which you know could be a selected um, advantage if, if you're able to, to run a lot. But I would dare say that this criticism that this is artificial is probably not accurate. I think it's studying exercise in um, a laboratory setting is, is, is perfectly okay. So I'm gonna talk about now, in, instead of the exercise part, which is a healthy part, I'm gonna talk about disease, heart disease, uh, sex, and the heart. So we made some mice that were uh, derived from mutant myosin motors, so like what I talked about before, uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And I think you can see without having to measure anything that this heart looks really different than this heart. So this is a female with the same mutation in its myosin motor as in the male, and you can see a very potent sex difference. This is not good. Um, this heart doesn't function very well, and um, there's not very severe disease in the females, which is a, a fairly striking uh, finding. And so, as I mentioned, HCM has dramatic sex differences clinically up to about age 60. Males have much worse disease than females. Most people assumed it was the protective effects of estrogen, which a lot of people point to as the, the sort of be all end all. And I can tell you that it's a lot more complicated than that. So we had written up a paper that we had submitted to a journal and one of the reviewers came back and said, well, okay, you've got this potent sex difference. Um, it's probably estrogen. So why don't you do the experiment? And so the experiment is, will giving estrogen to males prevent serious hypertrophic cardiomyopathy disease? Alternatively, will removing estrogen from the females make the HCM much worse? And so the question was whether or not the estrogen would have uh, the effect of removing it from the females would make them more like this and giving it to the males would make them more like like that and so quite gratifyingly it had we did not get the results that the reviewer was predicting and so we took estrogen from the females and they did not get worse they did not get like these males shown down here we gave estrogen to the males and they all died so that was clearly a completely wrong hypothesis that our reviewer had um, suggested. And to his or her um, credit, uh, they said, well, this is a much more interesting result than the one I had thought we were going to have. And so that definitely needs to be published. So I'm going to turn to soy and heart disease, which some of you might have heard me talk about a long time ago, but it fits in with this story today. So soy has a lot to do with um, these male-female differences in this, in this particular um, animal model of the disease. So Americans spent $14 billion on soy products a couple of years ago, and many people are buying it to promote heart health. So the question that we set out to address, is soy actually good for your heart? And I did get accused of taking money from the um, milk industry, and you'll see why in a minute. Uh, people from um, White Wave Soy Company uh, wanted to debate with me in public, and I agreed to do it, but it never actually happened. Um, and let me tell you uh, why people are thinking that soy could help you, particularly with your heart. So, and why is this relevant to this study that I'm telling you about? So what, what most people feed their mice is a soy-based diet. It is cheap and it's nutritious. And so when we saw this effect of giving the animals estrogen, when I thought about this with the help of some of my colleagues saying to me, you do know you're feeding these animals soy. And I said, yes, so what, what difference does that make? 
And they said, well, because soy has a lot of plant estrogens in it. So if you put them on a calorically similar soy free diet, you get a very profound effect instead of this soy diet. And so here we're looking at heart function. And here is the poor heart function on the soy diet. And if you remove the diet, have the soy removed from the diet and it's milk based, they have much, much better heart function. And I remember the day my cardiology fellow came into my office with feeling very dejected because he walked in and he said, I don't have anything to study anymore because he was studying these animals that had been on this soy diet. And I said, so hold on a minute. Are you telling me you cured a genetic heart disease by changing their diet and you're upset about this? And he said, huh, I hadn't thought about it that way. So we set out to study this um, pretty extensively. So one component of soy is responsible for these bad effects of the soy. And as I mentioned, soy contains chemicals that can act like estrogen and they are called phytoestrogens and they bind to estrogen receptors and they do a lot of the same things that estrogens do. And it turned out that um, studies in humans a long time ago um, that were done uh, to treat people with coronary artery disease, men in this case, they gave them these very, very high levels of estrogen and many of them started dropping dead. And this was a study that was halted immediately um, and I, had only, I only became aware of it after we had started looking at some of these uh, studies. So they gave them bona fide estrogen, not phytoestrogens. But if you look at the consumption of plant supplements that people, dietary supplements from plants and meaning soy included, you'll see that, that um, people are consuming large quantities of these phytoestrogens in the dietary supplements. So where do you see a lot of these in uh, human diets? So soy infant formula is chock full of these phytoestrogen and dietary supplements are as well. You can get tablets that have a gram of these things. So you don't have to worry too much at all if you eat miso and take a lot of soy sauce because their concentrations are pretty low. Soy nuts and tofu, again, not very high. And we've not seen any negative effects on females. We've only seen it in the context of males. So what are these advertised benefits of dietary supplements of soy estrogens? It was thought that they lowered cholesterol, that they relieve menopausal symptoms, inhibit the growth of tumors. And this isn't true. This is probably not true. Maybe there may be some benefit to shrinking prostate cancer tumors um, with uh, phytoestrogen and clinical trials have been done to uh, check that out. I think the results are a little equivocal. So how can we test soy estrogens in the setting of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy? So I told you soy diets are not good in the context of these myosin mutations that cause hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. But there's a lot of difference between casein and soy for everything else. So we wanted to reduce it down to is it the phytoestrogens that are causing these problems? And the answer is it is. And so what you can see here, we're looking at fibrosis. So more of this is bad. And so in a, a soy-free diet, what you see is we don't have very much of it. And that's shown here. This white stuff is the fibrosis and the disorganization is seen in the, in the, the hearts of these animals. So if we take the casein diet, the soy-free diet, and we add only phytoestrogens to it, what you see is you increase fibrosis tremendously. Um, and so we have reduced this down now to the difference between soy and purely phytoestrogens. The phytoestrogens seem to be the causative agent of, of causing a lot of this. So I am going to stop here and acknowledge people in the lab who have done a lot of this work. Uh, Massimo and Kiko Bugli, John Canelis, Kristen Bjorkman, Pam Harvey, John Deacon, Brian Stauffer, and then I've had lots of wonderful collaborations with John and Cricket Seidman, Jim Spudich, and Mike Jeeves. And I'll stop there and take any questions.
David, did you want to say a few words or should we just jump in with questions? Well, let's just go to some of the questions. That was terrific, Leslie. Uh, uh, so there's a number of questions in the chat and if you have questions, that's the best place to uh, put them in. Uh, the first question is from uh, Paul Mulred and he asks if there are skeletal muscle diseases that are caused by similar uh, gain of function mutations in myosin that you might be able to treat with the same kinds of small molecules that you developed for the HCM. So I did not plant that question with Paul. Um, that was the what I was referring to um, in saying some rare diseases. So we're now testing this compound on Lang distal myopathy. Um, and in our animal model of it, it is performing absolutely beautifully. I mean, it's yeah. spectacular. That's terrific. Yeah. Um, so uh, David Marbury asks if you're investigating gene editing as an alternative or a supplement to small molecule therapy. Our company is not. Um, Eric Olson's company is certainly doing that and it just got acquired by an, another company. Um, there are probably, I don't even know how many gene editing companies there are. At, at Myocardia, we decided not to because uh, we wanted to focus purely on small molecule therapeutics. It was a strategic decision not to delude ourselves. And I, I think we made the right choice. Do I think that this is gonna work in the end? For some things, yes, I do. So uh, just a, a related question that I would have is, um, you know, the high blood pressure can often lead to uh, cardiac um, thickening. Do you think your compound would treat that or is that a different molecular mechanism? Different molecular mechanism. And it's interesting, there is, however, what Roy's referring to is that, you know, the, the type of high blood pressure. So some people are very responsive to antihypertensives um, and other people are not. Um, some people are very compliant, meaning they take their medications and other people aren't. But the interesting thing is, and this is something we're trying to understand the basis for, even if you treat the high blood pressure effectively, if you've gone too long without that treatment, meaning you didn't start treating it until it was way too late, those people maintain big, big hearts and they're at much higher risk for dying. So we're trying to understand what it is that causes some people to get their hearts to shrink when they get their medications. Because it's really only about 20 to 25% of people whose hearts shrink when they're treated effectively. So Lynn and Amy asked if people are still doing the septal um, myectomy. myectomy. Yeah. Yes, they are. Um, probably the best center for doing that is in Brazil. Um, and those surgeries that you talk about a sledgehammer for a sur surgery, what these, so what they're referring to um, is that they go in surgically and literally cut out a big piece of the muscle. And you would think that that would be a disaster. But these people are very sick because their muscle is too sick, too thick. So they just literally come in and carve out part of your heart. And most people actually survive that surgery fairly well, but it's an extremely invasive procedure and not very precise. So if we could shift to the soy thing for a couple of questions, because that's really fascinating. Um, do you think that extends to humans? Yes. I do. Um, I think it, it's also pretty context dependent, but for example, people, women with BRCA mutations avoid soy like the plague and they're, they're told to. Uh, uh -huh. So the, I think the answer to that is yes. I think that, that where you've got more problems in humans is in development of the immune system. So the American College of Pediatrics has long argued against giving soy formula to infants that have any kind of immune problem. So if you feed mice this soy-free phytoestrogen-rich diet, there is stunted growth of the thymus gland and immune function is compromised. Um, so it's, you know, I think that the data for this being terrible in adult men is, is less, um, I think you have to achieve the levels of phytoestrogens in your serum. So Paul, you're a scientist. So the, the, the concentrations of these phytoestrogens, for the rest of you, this is a huge concentration if you're not a scientist, 
but this is what we would call, this is 10 micromolar in your serum, which is a huge amount. So you'd have to be eating supplements or, you know, drinking soy infant formula for you to ever achieve that level. You'd have to eat, I calculated this at one point, there are these garden burgers or, you know, these vegetable burgers that are soy based. You'd have to eat like 50 of them a day to get that much plant estrogen in your serum. So a, a related question from uh, Julie Graff is why is there so much soy in infant formula? And what do you think about that in terms of its implications? So I think too much of anything is a bad thing. Um, and I, there are a lot of people being concerned now about soy formula. But once again, it's, if you're talking about malnutrition and there's a way to get this cheaply, then it's a trade-off, right? So I think in, in many countries, it is a predominant source of nutrition. So uh, Brooke Shepard asks, if you could comment a little bit about how did you actually measure the force applied by the different myosin motors? Yeah, so this is um, work that was done in collaboration with Jim Spudich, and it is what we call a laser trap. And what you're doing is you're measuring the force that is generated by individual molecules. So it's a pretty sensitive instrument that's not very widely available, um, but it's an exquisitely uh, beautiful assay for measuring force. So this was at the single molecule level. And uh, you mentioned and you, when you're talking about drug discovery that you found compounds which increase the activity of myosin as well. Are there particular uh, you know, cardiac diseases or skeletal muscle diseases where those will be really useful? Yes. Well, particularly cardiac muscle. So one of the most common genetic uh, diseases is dilated cardiomyopathy. And that's when you've got a really floppy, weak heart. And so those would help with many, many uh, people to increase their contractility. So when the, the leading healthcare cost in the United States is heart failure, and this is where, this is not the same thing as a heart attack. It's where your muscle is very uh, weak and can't pump blood very well. And um, the 50% the survival at five, there's only 50% survival of people from the first diagnosis with heart failure. So that's a pretty significant mortality. So it's a big target population. And the, there are now genetic causes of this. So again, we would develop this in the setting of genetic cardiomyopathies as opposed to people who've gotten heart failure from you know, 50 different routes. Do you think, um, you know, genetically um, defined males taking high doses of estrogen would be an increase for heart, uh, at risk of heart disease? I would think so, whether there are data suggesting that, I don't know, but what I will say, so Kristen just said yes, that they are in the chat. Um, the, the case where um, there's very clear evidence um, are in transgender males who have been taking lots and lots of estrogen, not, not phytoestrogens, but estrogen. Real estrogen yeah. They have a 50 fold risk of um, developing uh, clots. I see. It's, it's really potent. Well, any more questions? Ah, here we have another one. So um, uh, Brooke asks, if male hearts tend to be stiffer and have lower function and female mice's hearts are generally have better responses to exercise, why do you think so many women are still dying of heart disease? Do you think it's more physiological or do the situations of women being turned away so the emergency the, room? That's probably not contributing to the epidemiology of this because what happens after, so again, this speaks towards estrogen, even though there's still a lot of controversy about this. It swaps about death rates. So many more women die than men as they get older. And it's not really clear what the cause of that is. People have speculated it's the loss of estrogen that does lead to that. Vascular stiffness, for example, can develop um, in those ages, but many more women die post, let's say 65, 70 years old than men. It's probably so, a cop. It's probably complicated by both social and physiological yeah, aspects. Absolutely. Both, yeah. All right. Well, um, 
if there's no more questions, I think we should all thank Leslie for a really uh, stimulating and terrific lecture. Um, thank you. And, um, uh, and I promised Roy and everybody else that I would not go over. And as usual, <laughs> I stuck to my guns. <laughs> Nobody likes talks that go too late. Uh, Kay Young or David, is there anything that we need to do in closing or? Yeah, we'll turn it over to Dave. Dave, you're on mute to close us out for the night. I apologize for my audio failure here. Uh, uh, Xfinity was messing around with my Wi-Fi. It may have been a source of a problem. I don't know. Uh, anyway, I'm pleased to welcome those from near and far who uh, participated as uh, listeners in this, in this lecture. And what I found wonderful about the lecture is it proves to people that academic research can have immediate consequences for human beings. And that's a problem because a lot of people believe that we just function off in a, a, another world. And there are benefits to the community for this research. And it's good to know what, what some of them are. Uh, um, uh, th this is one of a, a series of lectures that's being given by Boulder, by CU faculty who hold the title of Distinguished Professor. And these lectures will go on through the fall and uh, even into the winter. And, and, that, and at this point, I have to thank Kim Malville and Bob Grossman for the organizational effort to make all this happen and Kai Young Wolf for her phenomenal administrative and technology expertise, which makes the uh, technology, even though I wasn't too successful, makes the technology work. So I, I appreciate all of that. And I hope that you'll come back for more of these lectures in the future. We have a, a kind of a interesting collection of people who will speak on various topics, science, social science, uh, um, engineering, all kinds of things which are relevant, many things which are relevant uh, to the community. So thanks again to everybody who uh, participated in this and uh, we look forward to more in the future. And Leslie, thank you a million for participating in this. It was a great presentation. Well, thank you, thank I really enjoyed it. Nice seeing you again, Dave, after so thank many you. years.